Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a very special night. We are so pleased to be telling you her story of hip hop. I am Asma Naeem, the Dorothy Wagner Wallace Director here at the Baltimore Museum of Art. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to a really special program. I, I can't believe we have the ladies who we have here tonight, so thank you uh, for making the time. We're celebrating an exhibition that is, as you may have read, getting some pretty decent reviews. It's called The Culture hip-hop, and contemporary art in the 21st century. The culture is a celebration of community itself. As some of you may know, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. <laughs> 50 years ago, a neighborhood party in the Bronx hosted by DJ Cool Herc and his sister Cindy Campbell, gave rise to what has become the most dominant cultural force across the world. If you don't know, now you know. <laughs> this exhibition is open to all of you who are attending this very special evening. We hope that you will be excited and energized and moved by what you see in the culture and that you enjoy the opportunity to connect with your peers in Baltimore's fabulous arts community. And let me just say this, ladies, this is your night. One more thing about the exhibition. The culture unites a community of creative powerhouses, artistic excellence. It weaves together the best examples of visual art, the best examples of fashion, and material culture. You will see things like jewelry and grills and wigs that will blow your mind. And all of this to demonstrate hip hop's resounding impact over these past two decades on the world of contemporary art. Before we get into introductions, I wanted to thank Tracy Beal for her incredible work in organizing tonight's event. Let's give a shout out to Tracy. Before we begin, I want to give a shout out to all of you for showing up and for willing to hear her story. It is her story that we're listening to tonight. And you will have, I think, an unbelievably different view of hip hop after tonight's panel. So with us on um, this panelist discussion are MC Sharak. the first influential woman MC of hip hop culture and often called the mother of the mic. We also have Claw Money. A graph writer, a graffiti writer, and fashion designer, and you will see the fashion tonight on this stage is going to blow your mind. And last but not least, we have T.T. the Artist. A brilliant, brilliant rapper, artist, and director. And leading the entire discussion, moderating the entire discussion, is a pioneer um, in the hip hop field in terms of archiving, in terms of documenting, in terms of doing that not necessarily sexy work of making sure that everything is recorded for generations to come. But she is sexy, I will say that. That's Martha Diaz, MD, an award-winning community organizer, media producer, archivist, curator, educator, and social entrepreneur. 
Martha has traversed the hip hop entertainment industry, the public arts and education sector, and the academy over the past 30 years. It was a joy to get to know Martha better over these past few years. She advised us as we conceived of this exhibition. She educated us. I was taken to school. <laughs> and I think you will be too as you listen to her tonight. So before I turn it over to Martha and these amazing, amazing women panelists, I would like to thank all of the generous local cultural partners and women-owned businesses that have donated auction items for this evening's event. That should be really fun for you all, to classic catering, for the delicious food and drink that you'll have after the event, as well as to Crimson and Clover for the beautiful floral arrangements. Let's give a hand to everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. Well, check, check, yes. Let's get this party started, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I see some friends, I see colleagues, collaborators. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And yes, you're in for a treat because we have legends on this uh, panel. We have trailblazers, pioneers. I mean, I, this is the place to be. And I'm not gonna go into the whole bio because we're gonna take a journey together, right? Because I want you to really understand the making of an artist. And we're gonna begin, and you know, panel, you know we talked about you, you telling your story, so feel free, even though we have a limited time and we're gonna try to get to Q&A, but it's really important that you hear the whole story. Usually we have these questions and sound bite answers, but we're gonna, we're gonna go deeper today. So my first question I had for the panel was, can you please share an image of you as a child to, sh to illustrate you know, who you were back then and, you know, uh, you'll see these beautiful pictures. Let's start with <laughs> Claw Money. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. It's so hard to get a, a childhood photo of mine because they're all at my mother's house in some book somewhere in some closet. And um, I was a very shy child that um, didn't find their passion until... Um, I really was a, a, a late in my teenage years, a late bloomer, and uh, I felt very invisible. I felt very um, stifled as a child. Not anymore. What, what do you mean stifled? <laughs> stifled that you weren't um, allowed to do, say or do your creative? I, you know, my, both my parents were immigrants, and I think that they pinned a lot of hopes and dreams on me of what I should be. And there was a lot of expectation placed on me um, to sort of fulfill their vision, and I don't want any part of that. <laughs> so uh, as a child, I, I, I wanted to do other things to express myself, and it was looked down upon. Yeah. I can relate, because I... I come from immigrant parents. I'm first generation Colombian American. What? Where are you from? Where's your family from? My family, but uh, I'm Jewish. My family escaped uh, Nazi Germany. Both my uh, mm. my my mother directly and my father's uh, parents had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was like yes. a safety baby. Yes. Yeah, my my parents uh, escaped as well, but for other reasons. You know, the drug cartel in Colombia, and so a lot of expectations, you know, go to law school, medical school, and I was like, what? Hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> Same, yes. my sister's a doctor. Yes, yes, yes. 
All right, let's go to the next image. Ooh. Oh, snap. Yep. Oh, snap. Oh, snap. Somebody say, ho. Oh. Yeah. 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 So what are we going to talk about, Martha? So who is this young Shahrock? How old were you? I was about 16 uh, years old there. But, but that's not when you started rhyming. Oh, no. Oh, no. So listen, this is what happened. My name is MC Shahrock. I'm a founding member of the MC hip hop culture from its inception. The first female MC to ever do it in the Bronx that set the standards for every other female and male MC that came behind me. Fact. So this right here, this right here, y'all, I started. Let me tell y'all, I helped started this trillion dollar business. You hear me? And this picture right here was taken by Charlie Ahern. I was at a party, uh, well, at, at the park up in the Bronx that was called The Valley. And what happened was he was just trying to get into finding his way in hip hop. So he heard about, you know, my group, the Brothers Disco and the Funky Four, having a park jam. And so Charlie Ahern came up to the Bronx. He is the director and producer of the movie Wow Style. So he came up to the Bronx and he took this famous picture that you will see all over the world, even in Basquiat's, you know, um, of, of, of pictures that he has in Paris and uh, uh, what is it, fruit, fruit, Fruitisco? What is that thing that was oh, out? Fotografiska. Yeah, 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 that too. You see that picture every single where it's a picture synonymous because that happened in 1980 even though I became a B-girl break dance in 1976 and I became the first female MC of hip-hop coach in 1977. Woo! All right? Yes. Okay, so what was happening at home that got you to this point? Like, was there music playing at home? Were you well, encouraged to do this? In late 1968, I was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, right? And so what happened was there was a lot of things going on in Wilmington, North Carolina, you know, with r racism and all that stuff. So my parents wanted to leave uh, North Carolina, and, and they thought that they could find a better place in New York City. And so we first moved to Manhattan. We lived in a, a two-bedroom apartment. It was four of us, you know, plus my mother and, and stepdad. And then we moved to the Bronx, you know. And then from the Bronx, we moved back to Manhattan. Then from Manhattan, we moved to the Bronx. So my mother was a nomadic. Like, I was a nomadic B-girl. She was a mo nomadic mover. When she didn't want to pay the rent in, with the landlord, she would move to different places. And that's what we did. You know what I'm saying? She moved around. But, I mean, for me, music was always the background. I, used to, I, I grew up on Jackson 5. I grew up on Elvis Presley. I grew up on um, the, uh, uh, Isaac Hayes, Millie Jackson. You know, all of those different artists was what was who inspired me to be able to be that MC, that mic controller, that mic checker, the master of ceremony. I study all of these uh, artists, including James Brown, which is one of my favorite artists of all times. So were you in talent shows? How did you get put on? Yes, what happened was um, when I was eight years old, we moved up to the Bronx. So my mother wanted to be able to uh, try to feel a way through and find out what New York City was about. And so she enlisted me, you know, in... Um, and a talent show at the local center in the projects in the Bronx on Webster Avenue. And so what happened was she wrote my first rhyme, you know, my first rhyme when I was eight years old. And from that day on, I took off. When we was going from moving from one place to another, you know, I began to start writing my own rhymes. And then I auditioned, you know, for a, a group that was called the Brothers Disco by the time I got in my teens to become that first female MC of hip hop culture. Wonderful. And we'll get into a little bit more. Yes, ma'am. How you evolved from there. Okay, next picture. TT, the artist. Wow. What? Tell us about Hey, everybody, this. how y'all feeling? I just want to kick Got off fans. and say it's good to be back in Baltimore. You know, this was my stomping grounds and, you know, the very reason I am TT, the artist, today as a creative. So, shout out to Baltimore. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is a picture of me in high school. I think this was like maybe my uh, junior year in high school. And um, I was actually the first, I went to a like predominantly black high school, Dillard School of the Arts in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And if anybody's from the South, um, they know that the band culture is really big down there. And the crazy part about this is I started in the band as a dancer. And uh, 
I was the first ever in the history of the high school to audition and, and become the drum major. I didn't know how to play an instrument uh, or read music or conduct or even march. But um, one of the things, and that showed me women empowerment very early on before I even knew what it was because coming from the dance team, which we call the auxiliary squad, it's all women, you know what I mean, all girls. And so the drum major's position is a predominantly male position. Your, your job is to control and lead the entire band. And so uh, I had to go through this crazy boot camp and learn how to march. And, and it was really hard physically because that metal thing, that thing alone was like probably a good 25 pounds. And you had to know how to do tricks. So, you know, a lot of people were laughing at me who are, had been in the band since like middle school. And they were like, ha ha, like, you don't know how to march. Da, 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 da. And I don't know, it was just a determination in me to be like, I'm a good leader though. And so when it came down to the last, like it was three drum majors getting picked. They had picked the last two, or the first two, and it was what third slot left. And then they announced that I got the position. So from there, it was like, to me, this was like maybe the, the kickstart of me being a performer, you know, being able to perform in front of like big crowds of people and just knowing how to like command the stage. We had to learn all that being in the band. How, how old were you? I think I was probably like uh, maybe 14, no, no, 15, 15-ish, 15 16-ish around that time. Okay. So were you encouraged at home? Um, well, you know, the funny thing is I actually grew up in a very religious home. So like all the way before high school, it was almost like a cultish environment. So I wasn't allowed to do anything. I was told literally everything was a sin. You couldn't dance, you couldn't listen to secular music. Um, so I would actually sneak and listen to like hip hop and 90s dance music, which is where I came up on, like Uncle Luke, Two Live Crew, you know, all those types of uh, artists. And then, yeah, and then like, of course, the female 90s rap wave, you know, Lauryn Hill, Kim, Queen Latifah was like my biggest role model at the time. Um, so I wasn't allowed to really partake in anything that seemed worldly up until like high school, and that's when my mom kind of separated from that institution of the religion. And um, all of a sudden, it was just like a whole new world. And I always say that's when I felt like life began for me. So yeah. Well, you know, I, one of the things that I notice um, do, in the work that I do as an archivist is that a lot, I would say most, I would say 99% of the hip hoppers, hip hop, pioneers, artists, they are collectors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've lost a few pioneers recently. For example, um, Bismarcky, K Slay, DJ K Slay. Um, oh my God, I, I forgot her name, but the sister, the Puerto Rican sister who recently transitioned, she was um, part of uh, a rap group, or uh, I forgot her name. I was trying to do too much. Um, but anyway, so with the archives, you can tell so much about a person. And so I've asked the panel to share an archive that they have, an artifact. So here we go. Stop, hold it, freeze, now. Girl, I like your ball balls. When we come out, if we just catch tags on the little bridge that's alongside of here, that should be hot because it's oh, very. Yeah. A lot of out of towners are coming and bombing right up here in the little industrial zone and then leaving. A <laughs> Wall City, I hit the Bronx. All right, let's go. What else should we do? Um, we could do that shit on the Bruckner's, but right close to here. Yeah, it'd be great. Okay, well, that wasn't the artifact, but, but it actually is, right? This is footage. Well, it's historical. Historical footage, <laughs> yes. What, what year was this? So this movie came out in 2005, and I think this was filmed in uh, either 2002 or 2003. 
uh, we did like two filmings. Uh, this movie was a, a, a big milestone in my life because I had started my company, which is now 21 years old, um, all the while writing illegal graffiti and sort of using the graffiti as advertising where people would say like, what is that? I see that everywhere. I gotta get that shirt. Like what it, and um, some friends of mine were talking to me and they said, you know, it's so important for you to reveal yourself so that other women know that you um, have been doing this for so long, you're putting on other women and that, you know, what are you going to be, like, 35 painting graffiti? So I, I stopped. <laughs> have you ever been arrested? Uh, yeah, I've been arrested a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a good we lawyer. I have a good lawyer. Yeah. We need your police record. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've been arrested a lot, and um, a lot of times I would really use uh, the power of uh, feminine persuasion. Oh! They said I couldn't paint graffiti, and I really wanted to try. And, and you know, and then they would sort of, you know, let you out of the cuffs or whatever. But, um, you know, graffiti is really like a victimless crime, so they don't really take it that seriously. So at night, you know, in the pens, it's not so bad. <laughs> you were one of the first women Right? I mean, we have a Rocky, what, 189. And I would say King. that I am the first woman to really, really put the smack down on New York City. You better claim, in, it. Uh, claim it. I mean, I'm the king of Graf I'm the king of the, of the, you know, and um, I also was like really treated badly by other women graffiti artists that I've really made it my life's mission to like nurture and love like all the young ladies that come into the culture. And it's really amazing to think that this movie 20 years ago, you know, was women were a novelty within the culture and it's completely different now. When did you start writing? I started writing graffiti when I was 17, when I started going to FIT in Manhattan. And I started going to nightclubs and everybody would take out a can, and I was like, I'm Claude, duh, I should be writing graffiti, I mean, so. Yes, yes, I think we have, no, what happened to your artifact? Well, it's yeah, okay. I think it went in a different order. Yep, okay, okay, well, here we have Shah Rock. Yes, ma'am. And. What we got? Um, Blondie, um, and the Funky Four plus one more. Aye, aye. Right. So, where, where is this? All right, so what you looking at right now, if it's the same thing that I'm looking at here, because my eyesight is bad, guys, but listen. What happened was, because I was the first female MC of hip hop culture, and we was playing at all, actually my group, the Funky Four, and the Funky Four Plus One was the first group in the history of hip hop culture to ever play outside of the African-American community. We hit the punk rock clubs in Manhattan. We were the first group. I was the first female MC to introduce hip hop to punk rock clubs down in Manhattan. And so Blondie heard about, well, Debbie Harry from the group Blondie, she heard about us. And um, we performed like in uh, 1980, you know, in a, a club uh, that was called The Kitchen. It was primarily a, a punk rock club, but they wanted us to, to come down there and perform what we did. And so Blondie introduced us well, Debbie Harry introduced us as being um, at this club performing. But because she heard about us, there was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, who was our ri rivals back in, in New York City. We were the top two groups in New York City in, 19, in the 1970s. But because they, we had a female, which was Shaw Rock, she said, I want the best hip hop group and the best street group to be on Saturday Night Live. And because my group had a female. We were bought off tour, off the Sugar Hill uh, tour back in 1980, and we was able to um, appear on Saturday Night, Night Live. And at that time, we didn't know that we made history. It was only like maybe 20 years later that we realized that we were the first hip hop group ever to be on national television, and that was Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Respect, yeah. Yeah, so it was, it was exciting. And we didn't know we was making history. You know, all we knew was, look, 
We're going to go out there and let the world see, the entire world, not just what was going on in the Bronx, but because it was going to be on a national television station, everybody around the world could be able to see what we was doing in the Bronx, and it was no longer contained to New York City. And on that show, February 14th, 1981, I, I was pregnant. I was pregnant. Only two of my members knew. Uh, uh, Blondie, Debbie Harry from Blondie was getting ready to sign us to Chrysalis Records, and my whole world was flashing in front of me on that stage on Saturday Night Live because I was like about four months pregnant. Yeah, so... You know what? But things happen. You know, I still went on with my career, and I made history that night, February 14, 1981, as the first female MC, along with my group, on national television. Yes. Give it up. Yes. But, you know, as mothers, nothing stops us, right? No, it didn't. Right? It didn't. Roxanne Chante also. Absolutely. Right? Also had a young, um, had a child as a young teenage teenager. Um, I wasn't a teenager, but um, I was a single mom, and mm -hmm. I was bringing my two little babies into the office, into meetings. And so what happened after you had the baby? Well, this was the thing. I had a great support system. My mom, you know, she was there, but my sisters was there. And they knew that I, I loved hip-hop so much, because you, you got to remember, I'm on the front line. I'm, like, right there when, when hip-hop is starting. And so we didn't have the blueprint. There was no blueprint. There was nothing. There was no colleges, classes being taught. You know, all we knew was that we were little, young teenagers with little or no resources. But yet we figured out a way as young entrepreneurs to help create this billion dollar business. And all I knew at the time was what I wanted to do. So my mother, my sisters, and everybody supported me. It wasn't until I signed over to that record label that I got jerked. And so I fell back and said to myself that I would never allow no one to take away what I love most. And this business that I helped create it, I would never allow nobody to take what I love most. So I fell back. I fell back, and, um, and I must say, like, in 1979, I was the first authentic hip-hop female MC to have a record deal. And so I fell, I fell back in the 1980s until I can get out of my contract and get attorneys to help sue for all the money that I didn't get back in the 1970s and the 80s. Oh, my God. Do you still have your contract? I don't have my contract, but I won a lawsuit against Sugar Hill Records. So them jo that George say you owe her money. And from 1993, when I came back from Germany and I filed a class action lawsuit with Grandmaster Flats, well, not Grandmaster Flats, but the Furious Five and everybody that was on Sugar Hill Records that wanted, wanted to be a part of the label, I filed a lawsuit. It went to court in 1977. And just in 2022, we won everything. Everything. So the first female MC to make it happen that stayed in the court and not allow a record company to take advantage of what I helped create it. That's right. Oh, my God. The, I've heard nightmares, like stories about these contracts. Um, I mean, really, hip-hop artists have been exploited, and it's just so unfair. But that is no longer the case. Right? No, 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 uh, Martha, it is the case. You still have young young um, artists out there now that's just still getting jerked from these 360 deals and there's no way that they should. The information is out there. YouTube is out there. You have the blueprints of the founding fathers and the mothers that could tell you what happened, but it is still going on today. Ooh, yes, so yes, ma'am. perhaps the problem is that we're not teaching hip hop in school. Word. Right? Word. This, this is what I've been advocating for for 20 years so that we can integrate hip hop in K through 12. And you know what? This year we're going to unveil a uh, K through 12 like hip hop standards. Yeah, to it's only help. right. Yeah, we're going to we're going to un unveil the unveil it in June and we're going to present it to teachers because they need guidance and so we're about to transform education. Just give us a minute. And, and, and we're talking about education. If um, I want to send a shout out to Dr. Um, Gillian, if you out there, okay, oh, hi, you. hi, that's my longtime friend. And also Bowie State University Chairman, yes. Mr. Williams, if you out there. I teach at Bowie State, y'all. I teach right. the hip-hop course. So okay. look. That's my family, Bowie State. Shout out to Bowie State. Yes. Okay, let's keep it moving. 
All right. Oh, wait, we got a little clip of you. Don't like my style. Just give it the mic and I rock, rock all night. Rock the house. Jazz and Jeff. Rock, shock, rock, turn it out. Shout rock. Don't stop the lady. Just get on your mic. Just get on your mic. Just get on your mic and rock the house, right? Let's go to work to the golden oh, road. Oh, you go there, go there, go, 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 go. Work your body, work, work your body. But make sure you don't jerk your body. Do it. 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 Do it.
or what they've paved the way for. And I just think it's so important that we continue to tell these stories out loud. Yes. Well, I think Queen Latifah and Salt and Pepper also won Grammys before. Oh, yeah. yeah. Forgot but about that. Lauren Hill just came home with, like, Remember that? Yeah, like she had the most, it was, it was something uh, historical uh, yeah, she did. She had like 12 Grammys. She's like, yeah. Um, so she, she wrote, produced. Um, I think the only thing she didn't do was make beats, but um, do you make beats? Yes, I produce too. That's actually another way that I'm uh, evolving. You know, as far as my trajectory, you know, I am an artist, vocalist, but I'm also, I found through my journey, I'm a producer as well, and I now have. You know, I have two platinum records now as a awesome. songwriter. Awesome. Yeah, what? thank you. Um, and independent. And I just, you know, even when you're talking about the business, you know, I think it's important that as artists, we learn the music business as much as we learn about the creative side. I personally took the independent route. And, you know, all of these stories, like, encouraged me to create my own woman-focused independent record label, Club Queen Records, which was... Woo! Thank you. Which I launched in 2018. So this year, Club Queen Records turns five. And, you know, fully independent, self-funded right now. And I just think it's so important whenever we work with women, um, we just want to continue to push their voices to the forefront, not just as an accessory to a male predominant industry or to a male's track just singing hooks, but you are a part of that production. You are an executive producer. You are a producer. I've been producing my whole life, but I was never told that. That's what I was doing when I brought ideas into a room that helped elevate a record and its sound. So now I stand proudly and say I am an executive producer of this project. So yes. Love it. Okay. So we're, we're, we're now going to talk about what what Favorites. the panel is working on today, right? So before you talk about this, like what, what was the moment where you decided, okay, I need to make money and create a business? Or was it when you were writing already, you had that in mind? I was born to be a businesswoman. I didn't know. Um, I really was. I, I mean, it's a uh, it's an art within itself. Um, I was a bartender and worked in a nightclub after I dropped out of college, and I started making clothes um, to go out in. And people would say, "Where did you get that?" And you know, "Can I buy it?" You know, I'd say, "I made it" or whatever. And then I was like, "Damn, I'm good. I like really should do this." Um, and I didn't, I was working as a stylist and uh, costume designer. I was working as an outerwear designer, but like I never mixed the graffiti sort of aesthetic, um, lifestyle really with it. It was just sort of like Claudia Gold worked her day job. And then, um, and I painted graffiti at night. I stopped painting graffiti, and then I met a young Miss Seventeen. She forced me to go back out painting with her, and like, boom, my brand was born. Um, but I am also an insane hip hop clothing archivist, and I have been curating. Um, oh, here we go. Here's some of my stuff at the Saatchi Gallery in London, awesome. celebrating Hip Hop 50. And um, being from New York, you know, you're so used to seeing this stuff, it, it almost doesn't seem, you know, because you could see some guy like on the train wearing this outfit like today, I swear to God. But in London, they're like these like impressive, like, uh, you know, historical items that are just, you know, from our culture and from New York City and from the Bronx. Yes, ma'am. The Bronx really, like, the world owes the Bronx a lot. <laughs> this, is oh, this is at Sacha Gallery, too. And uh, that shows up till May 9th, I believe. You've designed a few sneakers, too. 
yeah, I'm the first woman ever to do a Nike sneaker. Uh, yeah, back back in the day. But whatever, Nike, whatever, whatever. Man, I've done lots of stuff that I'm more proud of than that. No, but, but, you know, when you think about sneaker culture, most people think, you know, men, you know, they're the collectors. And by the way, yes, Bismarck he has a crazy Air Force collection. I think he has about a thousand of them. Um, yes. But you never think about the women, and women got their sneaker game, even though I don't have mine today. But, you know, the fact that you were the first one to design a Nike sneaker is really important. Well, I was involved in sneaker culture for so long. You know, I helped Bob Bito put out the first sneaker book, and all of the sort of, like, crazy press-worthy sneakers are my sneakers and me wearing them. You don't see my face, just my feet, you know. Here, I'm a model for you guys. Um, so it was a... Uh, it was obvious that it was going to be me because I had been sort of like repping sneakers in my fashion work. Because of graffiti, it's impractical to wear high heels. So you got to be a girl on the go, right? And so I would really sort of like fuse that with like my fashion styling and it became, you know, sort of uh, just like a, a natural partner, I guess. But I've done Vans and Fila's and lots and lots of Lots of shoes. Yeah. So many cool clothes. Oh my God. Okay. Who this? What you doing here? <laughs> Who that? Who that? That's me? That's you. All right. All right. That's right. Yeah. I told y'all my eyes was bad, right? All right. So, what are we working with? So, this is your Rock the Bell show? Oh, okay. All right. Yes. But, but, uh, but, but Remember, let's talk about the evolution. How did you get to rock the bell? So, so let me tell you, and I'm a co-sign on what you're saying, right? I knew I wanted to be a businesswoman, but I wasn't a businesswoman. I didn't understand the business, right? And so as we're going on through life, you know, and, and we're talking about hip-hop culture, and we're in the 50th anniversary of hip-hop culture, that means so, so, so much to me to know that I've just turned, um, well, 60 in October, but I'll be 61 in um this October, yeah, I'll be 61, y'all. So listen, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm retired law enforcement, also hip hop has made me the woman who I am today simply because I didn't want nobody else to say, oh, I seen her doing this, or I seen her do, do that. If I did my dirt, you ain't know about it. You know what I'm saying? So I always wanted to be able to live to the highest standard of what I felt all the elements of hip hop culture represented, not just the rap music, but the B-girl, the B-boy, you know, the gra graffiti, um, DJ, MC, all of that. And so today, to this day, I've, I've been very, very cautious about, about what I attach my name to because of all the little stuff that I went through as a teenager. And so when I attach my name to something, it has to mean something to me, like sitting on a stage and coming out to Baltimore, you know, to speak to y'all about the culture. And so it led me to when I retired from law enforcement, you know, LL gave me a call one day and said, look, I need you on Rock the Bells radio. I don't know what um, I, I want you to do. We already have Roxy and Shantae, but we need the history. We need the true history since it's the classic hip-hop station. And so uh, in September, I'm on there with Grandmaster Cass. He's from the Bronx. He, he's a pioneer uh, MC. Um, we on there together every day, Monday through Friday, um, 10 to 1, on LL Cool J's Rock the Bells Radio. So y'all two went in. Yes, Sirius check. XM. Yes. Law enforcement. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What were you doing? I, shoot, I was in there with them inmates. Uh, but you know what? The thing is, it's like, I, I, even being in New York, you know, you had Rikers Island, you had, you know, all of these different types of correctional facilities. I always wanted to be in, in, in some type of law enforcement. Why? Because I knew that I was hanging around some crazy ass people, y'all, you know, growing up in New York City. So I wanted to ensure that I stayed out of trouble. And law enforcement was a way for me to go the right way because you couldn't have no bad records, you couldn't get in trouble or whatever. So that helped me stay on the right path. And also I wanted to be a voice of the people that was inside simply because I want, even if you found somebody else doing something wrong, I wanted to be the firm but fair person. And I was. I retired after 20 years and I can still say I left, you know, law enforcement in Texas being firm but fair. You understand? Yes. You're also a professor. 
Professor I am, Shabra. I am. Bowie State. That's Bowie right. State. How, how, yes, yes. Where, where you at, Mr. Williams? I just want you to stand up. Yes. Where you at? Yes. All right. All right. Bowie State. Bowie oh, State is in the building. We, we teach the art and culture and hip-hop culture class. It's an awesome class. I, I've been with them going on. How, how long, Mr. Williams? All right. All right. So, yo, we love, we loving it. We loving it. He traveled all the way, you know, here, you know, to be able to be here with us today. And you're going to be here tomorrow with a whole group of students. Yeah, you, right. you come in. You, all right. Bring them all. Yes. All right. Let's go. This is what you're working on? Oh, this is the Excuse me, Susan. My name is Connie Winter, and the last time I checked, I was your supervisor. You never dreamed of doing anything else besides working at this desk? Security ain't so bad. Sometimes you have to learn how to turn these lemons into lemonade. When I get my big break, it'll be for the whole world to see. Ebony. Darnell Cash, it's been years. Well, that's my cue. What is this, Ebony 8? Hello, welcome to Ebony 8. Meet your future. Ready to be sad? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, that is actually a trailer of my first scripted piece that I wrote and uh, produced and directed. Um, Ebony 8, which is a black sci-fi musical comedy. I'm a genre bender. Um, my journey has really led me on a lot of different paths, and I feel like, you know, just being a multi-hyphenate creative, I just mix the worlds together. And so um, I actually attended art college. I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art. Thank you. And um, while I was there, I just studied a lot of mediums. You know, I studied sound. I studied um, just, just the full gamut, because I didn't quite know what I wanted to do when I was a freshman or sophomore. So I, you know, I figured, let me do general fine arts and I could build my own curriculum. And I didn't really figure it out like most people, so um, till later. But what it ended up doing is it gave me all these different tools, like Photoshop and Illustrator. It just gave me these different tools to pick and pull from whenever I wanted to communicate a certain message. So um, today I am directing. I just had a film that was on Netflix for like two years. It was my first film ever. Dark City Beneath the Beat. Um, thank you. Since we're talking about first, this is the first Baltimore Club claim it. hybrid musical documentary with an all original Baltimore Club soundtrack. And it featured over 150 plus Baltimore creatives. So it was a truly uh, passion project that was also self-funded. And then later on, Issa Rae came on board and helped us push it through the finish line with funding. So I'm very happy that I was able to create something out of literally nothing. And you know, now we're in this like, I'm in this script writing world, and Ebony 8 is kind of the spark of a beginning of you know my trajectory into like. T.T. the artist to T.T. like that director, you know, a lot of my influences like Steven Spielberg, Spike Lee, and, you know, I want to be a woman in the, the film industry that really bridges the universes together. So I'm doing a lot of world building right now. One of the artists um, that I'm inspired by right now is an artist on Instagram. They go by Fat Nega, um, and they're playing around with AI art. And for those who don't know, AI art is this, you know, space where you literally can tap into your imaginary imagination, create these prompts to kind of create that visual that you see in your head. And for the longest as a director, it was so hard for me to communicate ideas because I just thought of stuff that I never seen. Like I want to create things that I want to see. You know, I'm not trying to take what's already been done. I'm really pushing myself to create the new nostalgic films of today. Like, what's the new Wizard of Oz? What's the new Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? So Ebony 8 is kind of going into that world. And so this is an artist that's been really inspiring me. And now the other slides are basically me jumping into my own AI design. So building out a feature version of this film looks a lot different from the short because it's, it's so many more layers to it. And ultimately, I'm creating a world that I hope that will reflect the evolution of black fashion, 
um, the evolution of what we as black creatives also go through navigating the spaces within, within fashion, art, and music. And so now we're creating, I'm just creating these worlds. And so we at, we're asked what were some things that are inspiring us today. And so definitely the AI art making process is really, really cool. And I hope to just keep, you know, growing and hopefully to be bringing more of my films, not just into theater spaces, but into galleries. You know, I, I, when I create these films, I'm always thinking about how these scenes can live on their own and exist in their own and also be experienced in their own, not just through theaters, but also through these interactive and immersive experiences. So that's where I'm at right now with my directing. And, you know, Dark City just came off of Netflix after being on there for two years. And um, we're going to be repitching it to the market to see where else it can go. It might end up back on Netflix, but we're also building out a doc series that's a spinoff of the film as well, where we'll tap into other um, cities that are reflecting music and culture um, from a lot of underrepresented communities. So, oh yeah. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, we really only have... Five minutes left, so we're gonna be quick. This is the last question was, what's inspiring you today? And TT already answered that, so this is, oops. Uh, what happened to the video? There was a video. <laughs> But tell us about this. I am very inspired by youth culture and more specifically children now that I'm a mother. Um, this is really fun. I developed all these little claw characters. I'm working feverishly on um, making a presentation to make a cartoon. Uh, it has two female rappers that are involved um, so that this is going to be like a space to be like really creative and we want to also like sort of add uh, a crafting uh, some sort of like teachable thing so we're um, in the process of uh, trying to create this uh, for the next gen yes yeah. I love the animation. I mean, that this is the, the place to go. Okay, so I think we're done with the slides, but Sharak, what is inspiring you today? People in general. Just being up here, hearing everyone's journey, you know, even out there, just hearing people's journey, you know, and, and for, for me to know that, listen, you're just not in this by, by yourself. There's other people that's out there, you know, striving to move forward. And just hearing their stories enlightened me to want to be the best person that I am, you know, today. And, and hip-hop. I'm inspired by hip-hop culture still to this day, being in my 60s. I love the culture to the fullest. And just to be here to see that uh, breakdancing, B-girl and uh, B-boyism is headed to the Olympics in 2024. That's what I'm inspired by. Yes. Okay, I know we're over time. Well, we got one minute. So we could have maybe two questions. Can we answer two questions? Does anyone have a question? Lucky, yes. Um, my name is Asad, uh, graffiti artist for 41 years, um, mostly DC, and I lived in New York uh, back in the 80s. Um, questions mostly for Claude, but I, I, I'd like that everybody's Opinion. We were talking. We were talking about women in graffiti, and um, it's kind of been my experience that a lot of women are super interested in graffiti. I came up in the '80s. My partner was a graffiti artist from the Bronx. Um, my daughters love graffiti and paint. Have painted. Um, I teach adult classes on the weekend. Almost all my classes are at least 50%, sometimes 100% women. 
my, my, my question is, I, I really feel like, I mean, guys are loud, obviously, especially the graffiti artists, were loud and boisterous. What, uh, I, I, and we kind of take over anything, but I think there's a lot of women, I want to know your thoughts as far as, I don't, I don't, really, I don't really feel like things have changed. Like, I feel like there's... Oh my God, they're so different. Well, first of all, if we're going to talk about like a history of graffiti, Barbara and Eva were like the original uh, gruesome twosome. They were, they were everywhere. They had more tags or more than any men. Like, you know, they're the mothers of, of graffiti culture. Um, I think women age out of graffiti a lot faster than men do because of motherhood uh, and life choices, career, maybe, uh, you know, they're in it as a temporary thing and then leave it where men sort of are lifers and maybe that's why it seems to not uh, reflect how many women are in it but I think that's changing as as uh, time goes on you see these these women are lifers too <laughs> yeah and, and for me you know graffiti I was never an artist but I was inspired by the artists you know when you talk about graffiti and the integration of hip-hop culture a lot of the um, the, the guys that would um, tag the trains would um, became flyer makers for some of our prominent flyers so I used to have them you know, uh, put graffiti on my clothing, you know, write my name on my shirts, on my jackets, you know, and have them transfer graffiti to what they were doing on the trains and transfer it over to the clothing and the art of, of hip hop. And that was the integration for me as a woman being, you know, in hip hop culture. But you know, graffiti is only illegal, right? <laughs> <laughs> You say it's only illegal? Yes. No. Yeah. Everything uh, else is just a setup. It, it, yeah. it, it was only illegal until we, till they transferred it over to uh, hip hop flyers, you know, and then it became legal. Sorry. <laughs> you good? <laughs> Titi, you want to answer that? Or you good? Okay. One last question. Go. Over here. <laughs> um, so I am a creative of all different forms. Um, and I just want to know, like, what would you give as advice to, like, help balance those things? And do you, like, give one more attention than the other? Do you kind of do it in spurts? So, you know, I don't know. Just some advice on creatives that are, like, multifaceted. Yes. Um, I definitely can answer that because people say this thing, you know. It's, it's that little ick for me. It's focus on uh, one thing at a time. Now, to be fair, sometimes that works for some people. Some people just const have one concentration and they go very, very far in that concentration, but it doesn't work for someone like me who has all these different things that you want to explore. And I think for me what works is understanding what the message I want to say and what medium is best to tell that message. Like for me, mu music is a universal message. So if I want to let some shit off my chest, I might just say it through a rap or through a song. But, you know, and then for, for me, filmmaking is more of, to me, filmmaking has the, it's a palette. It's like, it. I love filmmaking because I can use all my things. I can sound design, I can paint, I can do production design, set design, I can, you know, tap into the wardrobe department and work with fashion. I just feel like it's the glue to everything that I do and how I maintain it and, you know, manage it. It's not always perfect, but life's not always perfect. Sometimes things get a little wacky, but what I do is when I'm working on one thing, I will work on that one thing. And then when it's time to work on that, I'll work on other things. So if I'm in a studio recording, I'm not thinking about the paintings that I want to do. I'm focused on that project and I try to set up some sort of like milestones and goals to what I want to see the final results to become. So I just think a lot of it just is about really trying to balance and time management and schedule out. Well, what's the goal? Like for me, if I get booked to direct a film, um, which I can give an example, I directed a doc series for Alicia Keys that's out right now on YouTube. And that was like a two to three month project of on and off Zooms. And so I, I, I lost myself within that project where I couldn't really create the stuff um, that I wanted to do on the side, but it was paying the bills and it was Alicia Keys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, but in that, but also it was so beautiful working with her because I got to, she respected me as a creative. So she not only wanted to hear of my ideas as a director, but she wanted to hear of my ideas as how I'm visualizing the entire 
aesthetic and creative direction of the film, I mean, of the doc series. So you could definitely check that out, shameless plug, on YouTube. <laughs> it's called Noted, Alicia Keys, The Untold Stories. But I would say, go rogue. Someone told me um, recently, go rogue with your ideas. Boxing them in is doing yourself a disservice because within um, explore, exploration, you'll find what works. That's what I would say. Any advice you want to give on that, aside from? Well, I too am a multidisciplined artist, and uh, it's really hard because sometimes you have to prioritize stuff uh, that you don't necessarily want to um, in lieu of uh, doing something that seems more creative and fulfilling. but. Just take little baby steps every day and get towards uh, the end goal. That's my advice. It's sort of like do a little bit of everything every day. So it kind of keeps you fresh. I'm one project at a time. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. I'm one project at a time, because to me, I, I'm like, I be ODing, y'all. I, I, I got to be doing so. I, I like to go in hard when I'm doing a project, and I want to give it my best. And I don't move on to nothing until I complete that project to the fullest. So I'm one project at a time. I'm just saying. Yes. <laughs> What'd you say? Yes. Al. Yes. <laughs> Al. But just know that in this industry, they're looking for people like you because uh, there's like, I just, I'm, I'm just like, wow, you know, in the same way I can uh, direct a doc series for Alicia Keys, I'll have like a blog, like Bleacher Report hit me up and say, hey, we want to book you to do four uh, illustrations of women for Women's International Day for Women in Sports, four portraits. We're going to pay you a thousand a pop. Like, you feel me? So then now I'm up. Let me knock these out and procreate. You ain't even got to use paper and pen no more. So it's, it's like, for me, just people are looking for you. And you just got to, like I said, um, it's all about, like they're even saying, it's balancing that. It's, bal it's a balancing act. Some of us, we can't just stick to that one thing. I want it. I'm guilty. I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. And I lean on people like this also to be a part of my team when I am dealing with a, a bigger project. So I'll bring in a producer or an assistant who has more of a logistical mind that can allow my creative mind to kind of follow that schedule. So, you know, that's when you start to build a team, you know what I mean? Yes, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. What a great way to end this amazing panel. Please, let's give, a, give it up to this panel. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank We're gonna you stand so Look at him. Look at him. Oh. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you to the Baltimore Museum of the Art of Art. Thank you for giving us a platform. Um, you know, we are celebrating hip hop's 50th anniversary, and we are not. Um, women are not really included in the celebration as much as we would like to, but having a platform here is really making a difference because young girls are seeing us and we're recording this, we're documenting this, and so this is going to live on forever. So it's 50, hip, 50 years of hip hop. Yes, it is. Yes, That's it is. That's right. And, and, and let, me, let me say this too. Hip hop has always been inclusive to everybody. Yes, we know that it started in the Bronx, but from all up and down the 95 corridor, Jersey, Connecticut, Baltimore, we are all a part of hip hop culture. We have all contributed to the culture. Yes, and you can see right here, look at the panel, how diverse we are. And so we're gonna stick around Let's go have some drinks, some food, and have a good time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good job, ladies. I'm truly inspired.